Hello, everyone. I'm Nikana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all our participants joining us from across the globe. We will be starting our talk for today. Uh, our main talk for to today being about mammoths. I will be sharing my slides for now. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, Meg, that's visible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're a group of people uh, called Friends of Elephants. For those of you who are not aware of this, Friends of Elephants is basically an or it's not an organization and it's not trying to be one. We're just an informal group of people that are coming together with varied expertise concerned about elephants and other wildlife. The group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife, science, conservation, and welfare through art, culture, literature, movies, talks, and panel discussions. We have been conducting these events as offline events since April 2014 and from 2020 as online events. Our expectation is that people who have attended our events, formally or informally, participate or help in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife, including elephants. Our general schedule for today is, we will have our first talk on the evolutionary history of the mammoths by Dick Moore, and our second talk, followed by the second talk on the Ice Age and Batrock by Carol Lumpus. And then we will have a Q&A session of the same, moderated by Dr. George Diane Balvin. I am Meghna. I am currently working as a research in intern at Wildlife Institute of India in Dehradun. Our study mainly focuses on small, small carnivores and ungulates. My interest in wildlife sparked off as a kid, and since then, I have been an active participant in observing nature, I would say. Previously, I worked on avian acoustics in the Valpare region, where I witnessed the elephant habitat and its fate when, it, when it's neglected. This brought my attention back to conservation and preserving these areas and corridors to best manage the conflict. Our efforts in con conservation can only come out of research and knowing the natural history of the species and geography can help direct and channel the efforts in the right direction. And I am super excited and looking forward to today's talk. I'm delighted to introduce the event for today. The talk, the first talk being The Evolutionary History of the Mammoths by Dick Moore. Dick Moll uh, has been studying this a century of his life, excavating, studying, and publishing mammoths and other Ice Age animals, the Pleistocene megafauna. He is known for many different TV documentaries about the history of evolution and the hunting of mammoths by so-called modern mammoth hunters, the paleontologists. He carried out more than 40 expeditions on the North Sea between the British Isles and the Netherlands, fishing for mammoths. In doing so, he has repeatedly shown that the extinction of mammoths with their 5 million year evolutionary history and other large Ice Age mammals have been caused by dramatic climate changes. For many years, he has worked with Dr. Grant Zizula and his team at the Yukon Paleontology Program at the White House. Together, they presented the Yukon mammoths at an international mammoth conference in Taiwan in 2017. Over to you, sir. We can start talking. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share the screen. Everything is clear. Yes, Dr. Dick, it's fine, it's, it's clear. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, hello everybody. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you very much for joining the presentations this afternoon, organized by the Friends of Elephants. It's a great honor for me to present a short talk about the evolutionary history of the mammoths. Of course, everybody knows about mammoths and we know that it is one of the best prehistoric animals ever studied in the history of 
mankind. Uh, my talk this afternoon will start with a short introduction about what are mammoths, what we know about mammoths, and then we will start at the cradle of the mammoths on the South African continent. We will travel to the old world, to the new world, and we will have some conclusions. I try to make the talk easy to understand for the lay person, the man in the street, so we say in Europe. So if there are any questions, it will be a pleasure for me after the presentation to answer the question. The introduction. We all know pachyderms, especially elephants. We know the African elephant, which has been described in 1799 by the German anatomist Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. The African elephant is restricted to the African continent. But there's another species, completely different morphology, living in a different environment. It's the so-called Asian elephant, which was already known to Blumenbach because it was described, it was given a scientific name as Elephas Maximus by the famous zoologist Carolus Linnaeus from Sweden. But we also, and I guess we all know about the mammoths. And when we speak about the mammoths, we are speaking about the woolly mammoths. But if it is an animal like we see on the screen right here, many people, I think, will be disappointed because we all grow up with Fred Flintstone where mammoths and dinosaurs were living at the same time. Geologically spoken, they are from yesterday. And not all mammoths are equipped with spirally twisted tusk, with a short tail, very short, small ears, and a furry coat. We know the mammoths, especially not only from the comics like Fred Flintstone, but also from Ice Age 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, where the mammoth is still living in snow and ice. But if we realize that the woolly mammoths, as well as other species of mammoths, are large animals like present-day elephants, we should say they are prehistoric elephants, extinct elephants, they probably had the same behavior and all spent about 16 to 18 hours of feeding on vegetation to make sure that they have something like 180 to 200 kilos of food in the stomach. We know, especially from the woolly mammoths, the last species of an evolutionary lineage that it became extinct about 2,000 years before Christ, but that it had a long history of evolution. The oldest mammoths, as we call this group of pachyderms, originate about 5.2 million years ago in the south of Africa, on the African continent. That mammoth, called Mammoth sub Planifrons spread out over the African continent and arrived in the old world about three million years ago. It is called the Southern Amos. In a little bit, I will show you a life-sized model of this species as we think it looked like about three million years ago. Here on the screen, we see a nice, beautiful, preserved huge skull of a male individual and looking at the dust sockets on the left. Here, another specimen from Italy, from the valley of the Arno River in the Tuscany of Italy, a beautiful skull of a male individual where we see the partial skull with the tusk sockets and these huge spirally twisted tusk, typical for a mammoth about three million years ago. And this specimen is important because 
based on the fossils, the fossil record of the Tuscany, the species Mammutus meritunalis, the mammoths of the south, was described in 1825 by Filippo Nesti. At the time, Filippo Nesti, as a scientist, was collecting fossils and studying the fossils, came to the conclusion that the remains of prehistoric elephants he found in the sediments of the Arno River in Tuscany were looking different than those which have been described by Blumenbach. Remember, Blumenbach from Göttingen in Germany was the one who described in 1799, so 26 years before Filippo Nesti was very active, the African elephant. And he described the African elephant as an extinct species of elephants, and that it had a completely different morphology when compared with the Asian elephant, which was described by Linnaeus, as I told you in the introduction at the beginning of my talk. So a paleontologist is doing nothing else than making comparative studies. He takes a fossil and take another fossil and look at the same time to both fossils and might notice some differences. So when Filippo Nesti was making comparative studies, of the molars from the Tuscany area, he noticed that the woolly mammoths, which was described by Blumenbach, looked completely different. And he realized that the specimens Blumenbach used for his description of the woolly mammoths, they came from the north, from Germany, but also from Siberia. And he noticed the difference, especially in the molars, telling what kind of vegetation the animal was using. The woolly mammoths feeding on hard grasses of a cold and dry mammoth steppe, whereas his specimens, low-crowned molars, indicate that that animal was feeding on soft food like leaves, twigs and from trees, etc. So when he needed to develop or to invent a scientific name for his mammoths, he decided Blumenbach has his species from the north, and I am in the south of Europe. I will call my elephant from the south, which later turned into Mammutus meridionalis, the mammoths of the south. So here we have a species which entered about three million years ago, the old world, and was here at the beginning of the Pleistocene or Ice Age. Many, many beautiful specimens have been found of this thousand mammoths, like this skull from a classical lo locality in the south of France called Senese in the Auvergne, the highlands of the Auvergne, beautiful skull uh, which was excavated by a uh, farmer named Phyllis and was donated to the museum in Basel in Switzerland, where all the bits and pieces have been put together and where this specimen of a male individual equipped with this long spirally twisted tusk is still on display. Another beautiful skull of Mammutus meridionalis is in the Museum of Azov in the south of Russia. It's a beautiful specimen. It's in the, uh, the Museum of Rostov Amdon. It's a beautiful specimen with beautiful molars. And when we take a look at the molars, we immediately will know that these are so-called low, low ground molars, especially equipped for feeding on soft food, leaves and twigs of shrubs and trees. But this Mammutus meridionalis was spread out over entirely Europe and Asia. Also from the UK, the United Kingdom, but also from the bottom of the North Sea, the early Pleistocene, something like two million years old, from the Netherlands, from Germany, not from Poland, but also known from Russia. From my country, from the Netherlands and the adjacent North Sea, we do not have complete skeletons, the skeletons or complete skulls, but we have isolated bones, which are very nice, mineralized and beautiful 
shown in this picture where we see just one made of carpal one uh, foot bone together with a toe bone, finger toe bone, and indicating something like 30 centimeters at height, indicating that this thousand mammoths used to be a very large woolly, uh, a very large mammoth species, like one of the best specimens in the Museum of Paris, the uh, mammoths of Durfort, Again, about two million years, maybe one and a half million years old, but more or less complete skeletons, where it is on display with a woolly mammoth, which you will see on the right, much smaller than this huge Mammoth Maritinalis, which could reach a uh, shoulder height of about four meters, four meters and 20 centimeters, which is really a uh, giant. The woolly mammoth, therefore, is much, much smaller. But I guess we all know the woolly mammoths, not only from the uh, 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 movies which we can see in television, but we also know that there are many, many life-sized models where we see these woolly mammoths, short ears, a little relatively short tail, but extremely spirally twisted tusk. But there is not a life-sized model of a southern mammoth. And last year, we have been very successful in the Netherlands in creating a life-sized model of the Mammutus Maritionalis. It was done by a Dutch uh, paleo artist, Jim van Dijk, who got the uh, task to create under my supervision a uh, life-sized model of Mammutus Maritionalis. And here we are in his workshop. You see a standing... Uh, uh, we are not extremely big, but... Uh, you know, this is an animal, a model of 4 meters and 20 centimeters at shoulder. And to show that we are not exaggerating what we are doing, here I have one femur thigh bone of a southern mammoth with a length of 1 meters and 51 centimeters, uh, keeping it in the position where it is located in the skeleton of Mammutus maritunalis and you see that we are not exaggerating. Even this femur has belonged to an individual which might even be bigger than four meters and 20 centimeters at shoulder. Realize that the highest point of uh, the scapula, which is located in this area, is the highest point of the backbone in the elephants. So you see this is not exaggerated as we see often in uh, not entirely correct mounted skeletons in museums. And here is the finished model on display in our museum, History Land in Hellefruitsluis in the Netherlands, <clears throat> where it is attracting people, because many people first think, because it's not a furry elephant, is this a mammoth? Yes, it is. And then we give the explanation that the first mammoths which came out of Africa were living here in a subtropical climate uh, savanna-like environments, and that it stores here at the beginning of the Pleistocene, facing big, big problems, which I will tell you about later. And one more uh, image of this life-sized model uh, attracting the audience in the History Land Museum in Hellefoetsluis in the Netherlands. And maybe you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that the tusks are based on the specimen of the Arno Valley, which I have shown you a little bit earlier today. The Netherlands is extremely rich for remains of Pleistocene animals. No, not complete carcasses like we know from Siberia, from the ever frozen ground, where we have complete carcasses mummified, preserved in the frozen earth, like the Adams mammoths like the Tamir mammoths, like the Jakob mammoths, the Yukagir mammoths, and so on, but also mammoths, babies, etc. No, I'm not going to speak about these extremely interesting uh, findings from Siberia, which will uh, take me at least one more hour, but I'm speaking a little bit about findings from the Netherlands, like this beautiful fragmented skull, which we have trawled from the bottom of the North Sea between the British Isles and the Netherlands. The North Sea a shallow sea up to 50 meters of uh, water column uh, 
separates the British Isles from the continent of Europe. But during the Pleistocene, almost the entire Pleistocene, the continent of Europe was connected with the British Isles. The British Isles only became islands about 8,000 years ago. And the southern bite of the present-day North Sea uh, is uh, extremely rich for remains of the entire Pleistocene and the megafauna of the time, including the mammoths. So we have from the early Pleistocene, the thousand mammoths, and then from the middle Pleistocene, the so-called steppe mammoths, and from the late Pleistocene, the woolly mammoths, of which you see here, this beautiful skull. And we have not only a few bones, no, in a time span of five years, between 1997 and 2003, we collected 57 tons of mammoth bones from the bottom of the North Sea, not including 20,000 molars of the woolly mammoths. The area is very rich for fossils, as I told you, not only for mammoths, but the ent entire mammoth fauna. Again, from the early Pleistocene, middle Pleistocene, and late Pleistocene. And fishermen fishing for fat fish, they come across the remains of mammoths, like here, a beautiful, huge skull of a male individual of the woolly mammoths, where we can see that the tusks are broken by the fishing equipment, but the molars here in the middle of the picture are like the soles of your shoes, but in wonderful state of preservation, providing a lot of information. And we can study these specimens, telling that this animal might be something like 45 years at time of death. We know from radiocarbon dates that the skull is about 42,000 years old. So from the skull, taking measurements, we can estimate the height of the animal. We can tell a lot about the size of this male individual. But we have hundreds and hundreds of mammoths also including very young individuals and hundreds of thousands of remains of broken specimens like this upper jaw where we see uh, at least two different molars on the occlusal, on the grinding surface here, left the M2 and the penultimate molar and the last molar, the M3 here, indicating an animal of about 30 to 32 years old at time of death. And these bones, you can troll them from the bottom of the sea, but for that reason you need an, an, uh, uh, a fishing vessel to make these holes with big nets on the sea, but you also can find them on the beaches of our country. Uh, on the beach you can find uh, remains of mammoths, but especially smaller remains or remains which have been broken. So if we have an area where we can collect so many remains of mammoths, but never complete skeletons, if you have enough bones, maybe you can make a selection of bones which are belonging to animals of the same size, the same gender, the same individual age. And then you can make a composite skeleton like we did here for our museum in history land. And this is a beautiful skeleton indicating a male individual all the bones are original bones, except the tusk. They are artificial because we don't like to have the heavy support steel beneath it. So this skeleton is on display in our museum. And it's uh, one of the eye catchers telling the story about the woolly mammoths at the end of the Pleistocene, which unfortunately became extinct. And it is also telling some information about the sexual dimorphism. The male, here you see the skeleton again in the background, but here you see a female individual, which is much smaller, standing only 2 meters and 40 centimeters at the highest point of the backbone, together with a baby. Uh, a baby. And all these bones are from 185 different individuals, 185 bones of animals of more or less the same size, the same gender, same individual age, giving the story about male and female individuals, giving about the abundance of mammoths living in the southern bite of the North Sea during the Pleistocene when the sea was dry land. And it was, of course, a part of the so-called mammoth fauna, including carnivorous animals 
giant deer, etc., etc., but also bison. Late place to see steppe bison. And this is the most common animal which we know from the bottom of the North Sea. It stands at the highest point of the shoulder at 2 meters 40, which is more or less the same size as this woolly mammoth female individual with the baby. And you have to realize that the bison is the most common animal, might have a huge impact on the environment by the dung which is producing in the area which is dry, but there were rivers like the Rhine River from the east and the south and the Thames River from the west in the cold and dry mammoth steppe environment. Later today, we will also speak about inland localities where you can find remains of mammoths when infrastructural uh, works are taking place. But not only in the Netherlands, in entire Western Europe. And this is in the museum in Bottrop. This is one of the most beautiful skulls of a woolly mammoth with entirely complete tusk, spirally twisted, with very nice measurements. And it is in the museum of uh, Bottrop, where Tara Lampos later will speak about. So I'm not going to tell you every detail about the specimen, but realize that the skull is original and the tusk are found together with the skull. And Tara Lampos is going to show you a short video about that and will provide some more information. But this is like a Stradivarius violin in a museum. So... To finish the introduction, we will see, looking at the map here, that the mammoths started on the South African continent at a locality called Langebaanweg. The oldest mammoth, the Mammoth subplanifrons, as its scientific name is uh, uh, invented by um, uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne. Low crowned molars, not so many specimens known of it. Only one partial skeleton. I will, I'm going to show you that. But the animals, these mammoths, were driven to the north of Africa because of changes of climate. It became drier and drier and drier, and they were driven to the north and finally came to Europe as what we call, as soon as it entered Europe, Mammutus meridionalis, the mammoths of the south, as well to Asia. And it looks like that the Mammutus meridionalis in Asia developed or evolved much faster into the steppe mammoths, its uh, 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 following up as a steppe mammoth, also a, a large, high individual of uh, the mammoth species, uh, much faster than in Europe. And it looks like that this so-called Mammoth Strogonterii came via Beringia to the New World, where it gave rise to the Mammoth Columbi, but also into the woolly mammoths. So if we have a question, where does the woolly mammoths, the icon of the Ice Age, came from? I'm not so sure if it was evolving in Siberia, in Eurasia, or maybe in North America. Because if it was earlier in North America, it probably came back as a woolly mammoth during the late Pleistocene via Beringia, the land mass uh, between Asia and North America. It came back to Europe again. So this is a question which is uh, uh, something which needs to uh, figured out in the future by studying more and more fossils. But therefore, we also need to know what are the oldest specimens of mammoths in the New World. But first, we will go to the South African continent and we will start digging on an expedition for mammoths in Namibia. I was uh, very fortunate and privileged to be invited by um, paleontologists from France to take part, uh, to uh, excavate a skeleton of an unknown species in Etosha in Namibia, in a dry lake, as you can see here. This is not a snow-covered tundra, but this is an area where it is 
during the day between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. It's extremely dry. It was a lake which has been completely drowned, uh, drowned up, uh, dried up. And then we started our camp where our uh, equipment was brought to. We built up our tent, very luxury, with a kitchen tent, with a cook, with some people for guarding us because of the uh, carnivorous animals. And that is the so-called Ekuma River coming from the north, entering into the dried up lake of Etosha, the Etosha Pen. But unfortunately, when we arrived, the river still was held holding some water. So we were not very successful in finding our skeleton. But uh, after searching the entire area, we found our skeleton back and we were very, very fortunate because the water was dropping something like 20 centimeters every day. And after a couple of days, our locality where we found these bits and pieces of our skeleton uh, was uh, sedimented in the riverbank. We found remains of other individuals, of babies, like this uh, deciduous premona of a baby of about a couple of months to one year old at time of death, entirely complete but also some broken bones. And because this all is uh, broken, caused by um, trampling of present day animals, but other sides of uh, the bones are in wonderful position, as you will see a little bit later. Here, a very nice piece of ivory. The diameter is about 30 centimeters, which is extremely big, but it's completely broken. But if we dig it out, you will see it will become very nice. I was telling you that some of the bones, like these here, they have been trampled by large animals because our excavation site was uh, visited during the nights by elephants. The elephants who uh, also leave their droppings over there as a kind of souvenir, but very interesting for paleontologists to study. Because it's so hot and dry, you can easily take them in your hands, you can break them, and with the naked eye, you can almost see what these animals are feeding on. This is the tusk of uh, the elephant, 30 centimeters in diameter. It is a broken tusk, but the, the uh, tip of the tusk has been polished again by using the tusk as a tool for the animal to which it once belonged but in wonderful state of preservation. And even here we can see these beautiful uh, Schrega lines, which are typical for uh, the, uh, the so-called growing lines for all proboscideans except for the dinosaur. But all proboscideans have these beautiful lines, which you can see here, wonderful, especially here at the top, uh, lines which are crossing each other and so typical for each species of elephants. It's different. The angle of the crossing lines is different in Asian elephants compared to African elephants, but also to Mammoth or Stratus elephants from the Pleistocene. In the area where we found our skeleton back, we excavated all the specimens. Uh, just a, a few pictures to show how this works. You clean a bone, you cover it with uh, wet newspapers, then you put, when this is done, you put a plaster jacket over it, and then when it is uh, completely uh, jacketed, you put some water in the kennel around it, and then you turn it around, and you see these are members of our team, famous paleontologists from Namibia, from France, and a part of the entire skeleton is the vertebral column, uh, ribs, the rib cage, and the pelvic bones, and all these fossils are very, very interesting, especially when you take a look at the vertebral column. This is the sacrum here. These are the lumbar vertebra, and these are the thoracic vertebra. And what you can see is that the lengths of the vertebra are quite long, much longer than in any proboscidean uh, from the Pleistocene of Europe and Asia and North America. So it was an animal with a long and elongated backbone. When we take the measurements from the pelvic from left to the right, you see that the measurements are about 180 centimeters. 
which makes this Mammutus subplaniforms the oldest species of mammoths, an extremely heavily built individual. Together with all these bones, we excavated remains of crocodiles who were feeding on the carcass when the animal died about 4 million years ago, because the associated fauna of this skeleton uh, indicates that we are dealing with a fauna which uh, was in, uh, living, occupying the area about 4 million years ago. It was slowly moving from South Africa via Namibia to the north of the African continent. Just a picture to show how uh, easy it is to excavate, lying and excavating some bones. It's uh, like living in paradise. Taking all the notes of everything we find at the Ekuma, and making drawings of the area where we find the remains. And finally, when all these bones have been taken out in plastic jackets, it's indicating a uh, more or less complete skeleton, so to say. Then we had to carry them and to cross the river, to the other side of the river. Uh, not an easy job because these bones are petrified, heavy, and walking with them in an area where it is uh, something like 40 degrees Celsius, it's uh, not the best, uh, easiest way. So my friend, Remy Paco, who joined me on this expedition, was uh, very creative in making a uh, draft and so we could easily bring the bones to the other side of the river to the car. Here just the hind leg, we see the tibia and here the fibula, uh, the uh, femur, sorry, and I know that the femur was about uh, one meters and 45 centimeters in length which makes the animal quite big. Here our friends from Paris are making the uh, measurements on the Femur, and you can see from the head of the femur here that the preservation of these bones, even in the beginning, they look very bad. This is a wonderful material. It still needs to be prepared and to mount a skeleton. But this is a wonderful material, uh, as you see here in the sacrum and the last lumbar vertebra, as we have taken it out from the sediments. And uh, then we brought everything back to Windhoek. Just uh, a question how it looks like. Uh, Next to our excavation site, you see these animals, and they are all on the uh, Itosha pen, which is white. And you know for what reason it is? Because of the big cats. And you see one here, one lion. These animals, they like us very much because they were visiting us once in a while, coming to our tents, etc. But we had some very good guards uh, taking care of us and uh, chase them away. Driving through the Etosha pen, of course, is not prohibited uh, unless you have a uh, uh, certificate for that. And we got wonderful cooperation with the colleagues from uh, Windhoek. And we did a wonderful job taking out the skeleton and brought it to the museum in uh, Windhoek. But uh, when we left the, uh, the site, after three weeks of uh, intensive uh, work, we made a stop at the entrance of the Etosha uh, Nature Reserve, where the guards are and the organization is uh, having their base, and they showed us a wonderful set of uh, mandibles of present-day elephants, and they are all numbered, as you can see here, and this was done by Laws, who was a paleobiologist who had uh, about 400 mandibles of newborn elephants up to very old, very senile individuals where the last molars are completely worn down. No enamel was uh, uh, left over and uh, put them in an order from zero to something like six years old. And this is a wonderful set of material which we nowadays can use because from each mandible it's known how the individual uh, age of the animal was. And we can compare an isolated molar of a mammoth, compare it with a molar in this series of mandibles, and then we can tell about the individual age of the woolly mammoth to which that molar belonged. To finish the story on the African continent, continent from this Mammutus subplaniforms, uh, Remy Bakker, my paleo artist, 
with whom I'm working since three decades, made a sketch of how the animal might have looked like. Shoulder height, something like four meters, extremely straight tusk, probably a long tail and longer ears. We know this is an assumption. We don't know this for sure. But if we look at these ears, uh, we try to indicate that the animal was living in a uh, subtropical environment where it was quite hot so that it can easily lose some body heat by the blood which is streaming through the ears system. So after working in the fields, at the end having this short indication how the animal looked like, we have for the first time an idea how the first animal, the first mammoth, might have looked like from the exterior. So now we come to the old world. We have Mammutus suplanifrons going to the north, evolving into what we call the African mammoth, Mammutus africanavus. And it's that one who came via the Levant, via the Middle East, to Europe and to Asia. And as soon as it is arrived in uh, Europe and Asia, we call it the Mammutus subplanifrons, as it was described, uh, ex excuse me, Mammutus meridionalis, as it was described by Philippe Nesti in 1825. Here we see a male individual depicted by uh, Jaap Roos from the Netherlands. It is depicted as a pachyderm in a savanna-like environment. We see the shrubs and the trees. We see the difference between male and female individuals, uh, indicating by the trunk going to the trees that these animals were browsers adapted to a savanna like environment. Of course, once in a while they might have eaten grasses, but mainly they were feeding on leaves and twigs of shrubs and trees. And it was tropical, and that's indicated in this mural by the hippopotamus, which we know from Europe, from sites where we have Mammoth Marigionalis co-occurrence uh, with the hippopotamus Anticus, the old hippo, which was a little bit larger than the present day one, but still in a savanna-like environment. And then we see in the landscape that uh, the animals are becoming more fur, the tusk a little bit more spirally twisted. We see that the trees are disappearing. Now we are entering the middle Pleistocene, and we see slowly the Mammutus marigionalis is evolving into the steppe mammoth, Mammutus trogonterii, uh, a male individual and a female with shorter uh, tusk, small ears. We see it uh, is a real steppe environment. And this one, this species of mammoth, this intermediate species between Mammutus marigionalis and Mammutus primigenius, the icon of the Ice Age, uh, evolving about 200, 250,000 years ago into the woolly mammoth, which we see here, and then the woolly mammoth, of which we know quite a lot that it was living in herds, up to 33 individuals, as we know from an excavation in Sevsk in the south of Russia. But we know that there's a huge difference between male and female individuals, and it's depicted in this area, in this uh, mural. And, uh, of course, you want to show something which is very impressive and eye-catching, and that's a male individual living as a solitary animal, only accepted by a herd of mammoths for mating, and then finally becoming extinct in the late Pleistocene, with some exceptions, they show that woolly mammoths became extinct uh, only 2,000 years before Christ, especially on the island of Wrangel in the Arctic Ocean, in the far north of our planet, but also known from uh, some islands, uh, uh, the Primilov Islands of the coast of Alaska. So now we are entering the new world, the uh, Beringia today, you see at the, top, uh, at the top layer is the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait and then the Arctic Ocean at the top. And in uh, the Pleistocene, roughly around 18,000 years ago, there was a huge land mass between Asia on the left and America, uh, yeah, America and Canada on the east. And that, that land mass is also known as the Bering Land Bridge, where animals uh, moved from one side to another side. 
Alaska here, known for, uh, of course, Pleistocene mammals, as well as the Yukon Territory in Canada, the border, a straight line, showing here, and in Alaska, and in Yukon, and this is a picture from Yukon, uh, gold miners digging for gold, they have to uh, defrost the black muck, the frozen ground, which are covering the gold-bearing uh, gravels, and by doing so, remains of Pleistocene megafauna and microfauna uh, come across. Here we see the permafrost Pleistocene dust called black muck, and in these layers you can find beautiful remains of uh, mammoths and mammoth-associated fauna elements, like this beautiful skull in wonderful state of preservation. Uh, of course, working together with paleontologists from the Yukon on the left uh, is uh, Dr. Grant Sazula, that's myself, and this is one of the gold miners. Uh, very helpful because once they come across things which are important, which they have never seen before, they might inform the state paleontologist, Grant Sazula and his team, and then we might come across some things which are very, very important for us. Uh, we did some study on the mammoth bones a couple of years ago. The mammoth was not so common. Most of the remains which have been found by the gold miners and by ourselves are the remains of step bison, of large and small horses, and also mammoths, as you can see here in the collections of uh, white horse. We have three different species of proboscideans. First of all, the mammoth americanum, which is not a mammoth, but it's a mastodon, completely different from obsidian. We have the oldest mammoth in the New World, the steppe mammoth, Mammutus trogonterii, and we have the late Pleistocene, Mammutus primigenius. So this is a, a, a molar of a mastodon, completely different uh, animal, uh, beautiful, but the Molars are indicating that it was a pure browser and probably all the mastodons in the far north of the New World are from so-called interstadials or interglacial periods, maybe the Sangamonian about 125,000 uh, 125, years ago. But the Mammutus trogonterii, the steppe mammoths, which is easily to uh, separate from the woolly mammoths, is the oldest one. And some of, some of the beautiful specimens are known from Old Crow in the far north of the Yukon. These are the four specimens which have been collected by uh, Canadian paleontologists when working uh, on the Old Crow River. And these are the oldest remains of mammoths in the New World. Here, a beautiful specimen of a woolly mammoth. And you see all the lemonly, which are so typical for a pure grazer like the woolly mammoths, but this is from the late Pleistocene. There are many, many localities. All the green dots on this map in the north around Old Crow are very, very important because the oldest specimens came from there, all the specimens in the New World. And then around uh, Dawson City, we have the, especially the late Pleistocene woolly mammoths and associated fauna. The collections are stored in Canada, especially in the Ottawa Museum, the Canadian Museum of Nature, and in Whitehorse. And this is when you enter the Beringia Interpreter Center in Whitehorse, where they have this beautiful uh, group of mammoths welcoming you to the uh, center. This is an old picture of the center, but it was a beautiful skeleton of a woolly mammoth. And there we did an inventory of the remains which have been collected by the uh, paleontology program of Yukon. Uh, in the last uh, two, almost three decades. Total number of specimens, not so many, 625, which can be divided in belonging to 28 juvenile individuals and 586 adults and 11 seniors, extremely old individuals. I'm going to show you a few specimens of that. And uh, two partial skeletons and a lot of bones have been eaten by carnivorous animals, not bones. 
Juvenile individuals, the ulna, no joints, so easily to recognize. Everything is labeled and cataloged. Molars in beautiful state of preservation, telling about the individual age, can be easily radiocarbon dated. Very old individuals like this mandible of a senile individual, where you can see that only a part of the root of the last molar has been left. And that's all. So this animal was very difficult in getting the food grind to, uh, to uh, before it is digested. So this is what I call a senile individual. This must be a mammoth with an individual age of at least something like 66 to years. But some of the specimens are superb. Here, a beautiful part of a skull with the tusk inside, but the tusk is uh, not uh, a normal developed tusk. It looks like that it has been broken during life, and then it is completely deformed. As we can see here again on this side, here the normal developed tusk is missing. And one more, a so-called supernumerary tusk, because we know that mammoths once in a while do not have only two tusks, but sometimes they get three or four, as we know from the Netherlands as well. Here you see one complete extra tusk, a supernumerary tusk, as it is called. When we reconstruct the animal, you'll see in this uh, drawing of Remy Bakker, the normal tusk is here. And here you see one extra tusk coming out the alveolus. This is known from Russia. This is known from the Netherlands, from Germany, but also from Yukon. One of the most uh, beautiful specimens is the so-called hawk mining on 60 mile. A beautiful skull with uh, two beautiful original tusks, complete dentition. Here you see the tusk. Both tusks are broken during life. Uh, at least half of the tusk was hidden in the skull, in the uh, tusk socket, and only a small part was coming out. The same is true for this. But we see that the tip after this was broken, has been polished again because the mammoth was using the tusk. This can be attributed to a male individual based on the proportions. And we might, if we do an analysis of the tusk, we might come across remains of testosterone in the tusk. Here we see the tusk in anatomical position. And here we see that it was broken during life, probably in a fight with uh, uh, another male individual, uh, when the animals are in must, uh, they want to mate and they might compete with uh, uh, other uh, animals and the tusk was broken and we see that the uh, uh, in animal, uh, the um, uh, dentin, the ivory is uh, growing here in, the, in this breakage. Hog mining mammoths on 60 mile was a large male individual about 55 years at time of death. Both tusks were broken in vivo or during life, and the radiocarbon date 18,030 years BP. Another beautiful specimen is this one, where we have uh, 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 more than 80 remains of one and the same individual. You see the next, next vertebra, the scapula, the upper arm bone, and here the upper arm bone of this gold rush mammoth. Uh, in anatomical position to take some measurements. And totally of 85 elements, skeletal elements, have been uh, preserved. But we have to realize there are about 342 elements in a skeleton, including the hyoid bones, the sesamoids, etc., etc. It was a male individual, standing 2 meters and 60 centimeters at shoulder, uh, based on the analysis of the skeleton, the animal should be older than 50 years at time of death, and the rate of carbon dates is about 70,950 BP. The last one is Paul Pepp's uh, uh, mammoth, uh, named after the uh, uh, locality where it was found. Uh, 27 elements, large male individual, again, older than 50, years at time of death, and that is based on the fusion of the distal epiphysis of this uh, ulna and radius couple. Um, when these are fused, the animal is older than 50 years at time of death. Maximum shoulder height, around 3 meters, 3 meters 20, and that means it is a little bit 
larger than the so-called Hermes Memes, which I mentioned before from the permafrost of uh, Siberia. And Hermes Memes also was a male individual. The radiocarbon dates indicates that woolly mammoths during the late Pleistocene in Yukon were present between 45,000 years BP to 12,845 years. Uh, the youngest ones are from Bluefish Cave. And uh, finally, we want to give the mammoths of Yukon a face and that is uh, that they are more or less the same as those from other localities in Beringia. And they provide, they, the, the fossils from Yukon provide more or less the same information as we uh, will, uh, which we have from other localities like from Europe, from the Netherlands, from the UK, from Germany, from Poland, from Russia. So they are not special, but sometimes they are special, especially the Hawk Mine individual. Here you see the drawing of the skull. Then Remy Bakker puts all these uh, uh, soft tissues and the muscles on it, and finally skin and fur. Then we see it is a wonderful woolly mammoth with very short tusk, but that because the animal was a little bit having little bit problems because of fighting with another male individual. Conclusions: The oldest rep rep representatives in Yukon of mam the mammoth's evolutionary lineage is this steppe mammoth, Mammoth trochanterii. Mammoths in easternmost Beringia were relatively rare compared to central and western Beringia. And unfortunately, there are no records of latest Pleistocene or early Holocene mammoths in Yukon. But they don't have an, an entirely complete mammoth fauna as we have them in Europe and Asia, which is dominated by the woolly mammoths, but also uh, as a fellow traveler, the woolly rhinoceros. As you see a life size model here or here, indicating that it was cold and a complete skeleton buildup of uh, isolated bones. Uh, of course, the skull and the teeth and everything is original. The horns are artificial. But they don't have this species in Yukon or in Alaska. It never came across the Bering Land Bridge to the New World. On the other hand, we had never round sloths coming during the Pleistocene from the New World via Beringia to the Old World. But we know that the hyenas, who were not very common in that part of Siberia and Alaska, were feeding on carcasses of woolly rhinoceroses. Very interesting about the social behavior of all these animals, the extinct animals. But very interesting is that the Yukon has something which we have never from Western Europe, and that is a mummified baby carcass. As you can see here, the team of Yukon with uh, Grand Sazula here in the middle, and three uh, uh, people from Yukon working on this beautiful carcass, which is so special. It was only found two years ago, and it's still uh, under study of uh, our colleagues in Yukon, which makes this. Uh, uh, talk to something to uh, to uh, look forward. Uh, I would like to end in saying that this is such a super finding that as soon as we have the results that the world, that the news, the results will be sh uh, shared with the people in the world. And next year, September, so September 2025, we will have a new international conference on mammoths and their relatives in Mexico City. And I hope that our colleagues from Yukon will provide uh, new data on this baby mammoths, which makes the Yukon and the new world so unique for late Pleistocene occurrences of mammoths and other members of the evolutionary history of mammoths. Ladies and gentlemen, this was my last slide. I want to thank you very much for listening. Um, I want to thank also my colleagues worldwide working on late Pleistocene faunas and especially on proboscideans. I would like to thank Remy Bakker, Jaap Roos, and Jim van Dijk from the Netherlands being um, so kind always with me to produce wonderful drawings uh, as paleo artists. And I want to thank my friend Hans Wilschut for making the wonderful pictures for my presentation. 
and one more time, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk and introducing us to this world of mammals. Uh, we're slightly running over time, so we will quickly move on to our next talk. The next talk is by Karen Lopez on the ICH in Bot, bot Shop. Okay, may I start sharing? We will just introduce you and then we will be able to so. He's a vertebrate paleontologist. He is currently the scientific director of the Museum of Prehistory and Local History of the City of Potsdam in Germany. He was inspired to study paleontology as a child when, upon visiting the Paleontological Museum of his hometown, he first saw fossils of to seen mammals, such as the straight tusk elephant. After earning a bachelor in biology from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, he continued his studies at the LMU Munchen in Germany. There he obtained his PhD in 2021 and later worked as a postdoctoral researcher between 2021 and 2020. Between 2008 and 2015, he took part in paleontological excavations in northern Greece with the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, excavating the remains of fossil mammals from localities that date between three to seven million years. His research is on the morphology and systematics of morphologically disparate groups, such as fossil proboscideans and teleosphagians. fishes. Over to you, Professor. Oh, you so you can start off. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to start now sharing uh, my screen. Okay. So I trust that you can see my screen, right? Okay. Yeah. Good. Then, uh, thank you very much. Welcome to my talk. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this event. I'm going to talk to you about um, Ice Age in uh, Botrop and especially the fauna uh, that we find in that place. So first of all, a few things about the environment, the so-called mammoth step. Uh, this, was an, uh, this is an environment that's nearly extinct today. Only vestiges remain, for example, where this image is uh, taken on from the uh, Altai Mountains in modern-day Russia. The environment in the Mammoth Steppe was cold and dry, and because of that, the vegetation was uh, very low. So it consisted mostly of grasses, of herbs, of shrubs, hardly any trees. The Mammoth Steppe was the Earth's most extensive uh, biome during the last glacial period. Uh, that is between uh, 115,000 to approximately um, 12,000 years ago. So it extended across maps of Eurasia and parts of North America. Now, obviously, I don't have the time to talk about uh, the entire expanse of uh, the mammoth fauna. Instead, I'm going to focus on the finds that we have from a specific location, and that is the city of Botrop in Germany. And that is not only because I work at the museum of the city, but also because Botrop holds one of the largest collections of ice age animals in Europe. Now, a few words about the area surrounding Botrop. So this is um, an area that is um, um, uh, quite densely populated and it's a former industrial area. And its landscape is dominated by rivers. The largest of which is the Rhine that uh, runs here from uh, the south to the north. Here it goes into the Netherlands. And uh, the river we are mostly interested in today is here the so-called Emsa River, because this goes 
uh, by Botrop. And the fossils that we're going to talk about today, most of them, they have been recovered from sediments of the Emsa River. This is uh, what the Emser River use, must have uh, looked like during the last glacial period with mammoths and rhinoceroses. So this is from a mini diorama from our exhibition. And uh, this is what uh, Emsa looks like today. In fact, you can see here two waterways, the smaller waterway, this is the uh, actual Emsa River, and the larger waterway here, this is a man-made canal. It's an artificial canal um, that was constructed in order for goods to be transported with ships, such as the ones that you see here in the distance. Uh, machines like that were used to dredge that canal, so to make it deeper and wider. And uh, here, I'm going to show you a video how this dredging was done. So the dredging machine is here on the right. So it uh, pulls the sediment, all this mud from the bottom of the canal and throws it into this other ship. This ship here is going to transport the sediment away from the canal. And uh, of course, uh, the sediment here also contains the fossils. You can easily imagine that um, because this is not an excavation, it's just a dredging, even if we had complete skeletons, these are uh, disarticulated now. And also, uh, even if we had complete bones, some of these bones um, have been broken because of this uh, dredging. So now this uh, uh, ship reaches the shore. And um, with the help of this uh, machine that looks like a big vacuum cleaner, they're going to suck all the sediment here you see, with the help of uh, water, they dissolve the sediment. They, this machine is going to suck up the sediment and is going to deposit it um, on land. And uh, of course, this is another stage that our fossils can be damaged. So because of both of these stages going through this long pipe, a lot of these bones end up broken. Um, here, the sediment along with the fossils are deposited with this impressive way. And the man here in the distance, this is the founder of our museum. Uh, his name was Arno Heinrich, an extraordinary man. He came to Botrop in the 50s as a coal miner and then started collecting um, minerals and fossils like you see him doing here. And he amassed a large collection uh, he was appointed later a director of our museum, our first director. And then um, he started also publishing his finds um, in journals. And then he gained fame both in Germany and internationally. So here you see the specimens are brought back to our museum. A lot of them are broken due to the dredging. And uh, you can see here on the next slide, this is a part of um, our storage where we store the large bones. We have many, many more drawers with a lot of bones. Um, so far, we have about six and a half thousand bones of Ice Age animals. And what do we do with all these bones? Well, um, the first thing that uh, people did was to identify them and come up with this list of species. You, so you see we have here the woolly mammoth, um, artiodactyles such as deer and cow-like uh, animals, horses, carnivores. Um, we have also evidence of human presence, birds, and even insects. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of these uh, animals. Instead, I'm going to focus on these animals that you see here with red, because these are very characteristic animals of the cold stages of the late glacial period. And of course, we also have other animals that uh, were better adapted to the warmer stages, but here we focus on the cold stages. So as I said, we have uh, more than 6,000 bones of Ice Age uh, animals in our collection, and uh, about half of them 
belongs to mammoths and rhinoceros, woolly rhino. The reason for that is possibly because these bones are larger, they're harder to miss when uh, one collects. But uh, as I already said, we don't have any complete skeletons. Now, Arno Heinrich, you see him here, he wanted to mount some skeletons for educational purposes in our exhibition. And that is why he um, selected bones of a similar age and gender in order to build this uh, impressive skeleton of a woolly mammoth is approximately three meters and 35 centimeters at shoulder height. And he also built a composite, another composite skeleton of a woolly rhino. And uh, of course you notice that our woolly rhino has no horns. That is because um, uh, the horns of rhinos, they are composed of keratin like our hair and our nails. So uh, these are normally not preserved. But apart from um, all these anonymous, let's say bones of Ice Age animals, we also have a very famous specimen, which is the skull of the mammoth of Haltern. Haltern is um, a city north of Botrop. And Dick has already um, discussed this specimen. I know that you uh, already discussed it also in a previous meeting. And uh, here I want to tell you a bit about how it was discovered. So in 75, um, they were digging to uh, construct a sewage treatment plant. And then they came across this large skull of a mammoth. Close to that skull, they also found two tusks, large tusks that they fitted well into the sockets of the skull. So we know that they belonged to the same individual. And this is uh, the skull today in our museum. The right task is preserved in its entirety and measures two meters and 85 centimeters. The left task uh, is somewhat shorter, but it has been broken at its tip and this tip is uh, now reconstructed. Uh, based on the teeth, um, we know that this was an individual in its forties. And we also know that it is a male individual because of the large size of the skull and the thickness of its tusks. And uh, recently, we also, uh, our mammoth got a face. So uh, the Dutch army's uh, um, artist, Remy Bacher, under the scientific supervision of uh, Dick Moll, constructed this reconstruction. You can recognize it as the mammoth of Haltern because of the characteristic shape of the tusks. Now I'm going to take you from the largest animals in our collection to the smallest animals in our collection. And these are the remains of uh, these blue, blue bottle flies. So Arno Heinrich, when he recovered some other mammoth skulls, he noticed that here in these uh, pneumatized bones, this very spongy like bone that uh, mammoths have in their skull. Notice that these uh, pupae seen here in magnification, they came out. And what is that exactly? So you see here the adult fly. When an adult fly, for example, spots a carcass, in this case of a mammoth, they go there and they lay their eggs. These eggs hatch into larvae. These uh, larvae then become pupae. And through the, from this pupae, then the adult fly emerges, leaving behind the pupae that we actually find. And this is also very interesting because it's an interaction uh, that we see in the fossil record um, of these two very different species. We have hundreds of bones of uh, wild horses. So all these drawers that you see here, they are filled with bones of uh, wild horses. And uh, we also find evidence of uh, um, scavenging on the bones of these uh, animals. For example, this is the pelvis of a horse. And you can see here this margin, this margin. And here, this has been gnawed by carnivores. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. We also have several bones of step bison. We have a lot of 
dozens of skulls. None of them are so well preserved as this one. This is our best specimen. And uh, here again in another construction by Remy Bakker, um, you can see that um, the step bison was uh, uh, an animal that lived in herds and it was very large, more than two meters of shoulder height. Some of them, um, as I said, could um, reach two meters 40, so larger than modern day bison. And another charismatic uh, large herbivore of our fauna is the giant deer. Uh, you know, might know it also under the names Megalosaurus or Iris elk. This animal holds the record for the widest antler span. So these antlers, they could reach up to three and a half meters in length. Three and a half meters, just to give you an idea how much that is, this is about the height of the largest male woolly mammoths. So we have uh, this uh, skull, and this is um, uh, an individual that it's uh, quite well preserved because it was not dredged from uh, the canal, it was found in the river. Uh, even though uh, a large part of the antlers you see here, it is broken, so it must have been much larger than that. Another interesting uh, animal, adapted to uh, cold is the so-called muskox. It's called like that because especially the males, they have this musky odor that's supposed to make them more attractive to females. And uh, even though this looks like um, a relative of the cow, it's actually closer related to modern day sheep and, um, and goats. My personal favorite is the Saiga antelope. Uh, this is a small antelope. The largest males can reach up to about 80 centimeters on uh, shoulder height. And um, I like it so much because um, quite honestly, if I didn't know that it existed and I just saw a picture of that for the first time, I would assume that it's something taken straight out of a, a sci-fi movie. Now, a word about the carnivores and the cave hyenas. Dick previously um, touched uh, on this uh, subject. We also have the cave hyena, which is um, uh, a relative or a subspecies of the modern day uh, spotted hyena that lives in Africa. And you can see that it has this uh, strong jaws and teeth and this large surface for the attachment of muscles. And what do they do? with all this apparatus. Again, another construction for our museum by uh, Remy Bacher and Dick Moll. This pack of hyenas, they devour this carcass of a woolly rhino. And they don't only eat the meat of this animal, they also eat the bones. Many of the bones that we find, and many of the uh, woolly rhino bones in our collection, they are chewed by hyenas. And we see the marks of the jaws of hyenas on these bones. Again, another type of interaction between these two animals. And the last subject I want to talk about is the pride of our museum, the so-called track plate of Botro. So um, this is a, a plate that preserves the tracks of animals. Uh, this is only about 20% of the whole surface. The other 80% is in our storage. We just uh, simply didn't have currently enough space to show it all to our visitors. Now, in uh, February 1992, when they were um, digging for a construction project, they came across this uh, horizon, this flat horizontal surface that preserved hundreds of footprints of ice age animals. Of course, we wanted to preserve it as it was, but that was not possible for practical reasons. So instead, they opted for making uh, casts. And as a matter of fact, they had to develop the special epoxy resin that could uh, harden under low temperatures. They did that collaborations with the company. Uh, because of course, that is February, and February in Europe is cold. 
At the end, they were able to recover 150 square meters filled with footprints. Every square that you see here is uh, one square meter. Um, 600 footprints in total are identified and um, the researchers were able to um, identify also 30 trackways. You see them here, their um, footprints united by, by these lines. 18 of these trackways have been so far identified to, down to species level. And this uh, whole track plate was uh, dated to about 35 to 42,000 years ago. Now, what kind of animals did they identify? Um, first of all, a lot of these trackways, 16 of the 30 trackways, they belong to uh, reindeer. Um, reindeer, um, both males and females, the kind of deer that both male and females have antlers and their tracks are easy to recognize. They have this characteristic hook shaped, their hooves. Everyone's favorite is the step lion. We have a long trackway, about 13 meters of a, a step lion. This is a, an extinct, now extinct species of lion that lives across much of uh, Eurasia, the northern part, and some. Um, and we also have a few tracks of a wolf. And lastly, we also have a few footprints of a goose. Now, the scientists who um, studied this uh, uh, track plate and they tried to identify it, uh, they were um, uh, Vicar von Königswald, Martin Walters, and Martin Sander. Uh, what they concluded is that these animals were walking um, on, a, on the soft sediment, probably on a floodplain of the Emsa River. We talked about uh, the Emsa River before. And they also calculated um, by here, by this uh, stride, how fast these animals were walking. And what they say is that these animals were walking calmly. So we don't see any animal speeding, trying to possibly evade the predator, or a predator trying to catch up to its prey. Maybe these animals were there to drink water. And the question is, okay, so why are you so proud of this track plate? What's so special about it? Well, several reasons, beginning with that tracks in general, they're very difficult to preserve compared, for example, with bones or shells. So you can imagine when you have something as fragile, as soft as a track, um, this by itself, to have it preserved, is a relatively rare. Second, um, there are hardly any other places in the world where you can have such a big surface with such a great number and variety of animals. So that is something really unique. And last but not least, these tracks were produced in a matter of few days, which means that all these different animals, they coexisted. Now, why is that important? Well, you see, in paleontology, um, this is something that we're um, usually trying to establish, but it's not always possible. Let's say that we find a concentration of bones in a layer, and we might assume that all these animals lived at the same uh, place during the same time. But of course, some of these bones might have been transported um, from somewhere else. Or maybe an animal died, uh, let's say, a given day, and then these other animals died a few years later. Are we sure that they live under the same circumstances? So basically, to have a track plate like that, this is the closest we can get to a photograph or a video from the Ice Age. So to conclude all that, what new things do we learn from the Ice Age fauna of Botrop? Well, first of all, we learn a lot about the biodiversity of the last glacial period, what kind of animals were there. We can also learn a lot about the interactions between the different animals. And we can also look at the changes in fauna. So I talked a lot uh, today about the 
um, the so-called uh, mammoth fauna, and the cold adapted fauna, but uh, I also mentioned that we have the worm adapted fauna. And we also have the animals that came after the end of the last glacial period, you know, the Holocene, the period we are currently in. And when we compare all these different faunas, we can uh, deduce what kind of effects did climate change have on these animals and their environment. So with that, I would like to thank all these nice people and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the thank wonderful you. talk. Now we will move on to the Q&A session. And uh, could you end the screen sharing so I can share my screen? I'm sure a lot of our participants have a lot of questions. And we will move on to the Q&A session. So for that, we have a moderator who is an experienced speaker. He is the author of the book, Dr. George Diane Balan, who is the author of the book, The World As It Once Was. He's an experienced speaker on biodiversity and environmental issues at events in Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. To mention a few, Chiang Mai in 2023, Tarangai in 2023, Yukon, Beringia 2021. He is specialized in megafauna topics and a member of the Pleistocene Mammal Society. He is a scientific contributor to different reputable publications such as Larger Than Tigers, Tranium, Ancient Origins, Africa Geographic, and Asian Geographic. In May 2023, Dian discovered the new all time world record Asian elephant tusk by length. That is 3.3 meter. Finally, he is a multi award winning fine art wildlife photographer specialized in megafauna. His photos have been published by BBC Earth, National Geographic, GEO, Wild Planet Photo Magazine, Asian Geographic, Africa Geographic, Nat Images, Ancient Origins, Pachyderm, and Cranium, among the others. So we will move on to the QA sessions if any of our participants have questions for our speakers. You can type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Magana. For the time being, I don't see questions in the chat, uh, but maybe the speakers would have some, some questions. I, um, I was really delighted to see again Dick and uh, to meet online uh, Charles Lampos. And what is what is always nice about Dick is that uh, he he keeps you know the enthusiasm of a teenager, if we can say so. But that is, uh, you know, in a very nice mix with a wealth of experience of a world class expert. You know, so that is I think really really nice. And for Charles Lampos, I'm a little bit jealous because I think he was there when those milia tasks, you know, were. Uh, excavated and all that, if I understood correctly. Um, so, Dick, would you like to to start with? Uh, yeah, it, um, thank you very much, uh, Dian. Uh, being with us this afternoon, uh, you cost everything because you started as an expert in the field of big tuskers uh, with uh, having paleontology in this program, and we did a presentation some time ago, and then you suggested. I should organize something like this. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, I just want to ask a question to Gara Lampos. Uh, we spoke about mastodons in uh, the Pleistocene. We spoke about mammoths. But uh, I remember that you also did some work on other proboscideans from the Pleistocene, especially from your hometown. Can you tell a few sentences about that? Yes, of course. Um, so at the um, same time when we have the mammoths, we also have another kind of elephants in uh, Eurasia, the so-called straight tusked elephant. And this is also closer related to the modern Asian elephant than to the African elephant. 
And um, basically these elephants are better adapted to a warmer climate. So we find them uh, a lot in the south of Europe, and we find them also in uh, northern latitudes, for example, in Germany, um, especially when uh, the climate becomes uh, milder, when it becomes warmer, and we might find these uh, straight tusked elephants and during the cold stages, the mammoths again expand their, um, um, their, their region southwards, yeah. So again, these are also indicators of uh, climate. Well, to me, these straight tusk elephants, they look like a hybrid because they have the top of the head, which is quite similar to the Asian elephants. They, they have, you know, like big domes. And then mm -hmm. they have the lower part, which goes very wide, like in the African elephants. They are sort of mixed. And maybe for our Indian friends, it's worth saying that they went all the way to India. And the biggest form of these straight tusk elephants was Namadic, was the huge... The, the granddaddy of them all in terms of size, maybe. Yeah, that's right. So I see a so, question coming. Um, if there is any evidence there is uh, about mammals or elephants burying their young. So, uh, um, is any one of you aware of su such a practice of elephants? No. Uh, I, I think I can answer this. At least it is not known from prehistoric elephants. Uh, you know, paleontologists are always dealing with bits and pieces. And in the past, paleontologists were mainly focusing in having the biggest specimen on display in the museums. They were debating about the size, about the gender, about the exterior. And they were not uh, speaking about the behavior uh, about these prehistoric animals. It was the late Larry Eggenbrod of Hot Springs, South Dakota, who started to work, especially on the social behavior of mammoths, because he was lucky being a uh, paleontologist at the mammoth site of Hot Springs in South Dakota, where in a sinkhole, at least 60 or 61 individuals of the Colombian mammoths, quite large individuals, were trapped. And all these remains can be attributed by measuring the pelvis bones, especially the burst canal in the pelvic bones, to male individuals between a certain uh, age of uh, something like 12 to 20 or something like that. And it indicates that these male individuals living as solitary animals in the cold and dryless, uh, dry uh, uh, prairies at that time, some something more than 140,000 years ago. Well, 20, Dick, it's usually the age when... Uh, you know, like teenage male elephants leave the maternal family. This is yeah. the studies in Africa. So this means that these young bulls, they didn't know exactly what to do. They didn't have the safety of a family. They were not probably in a proper bachelor herd to have the experience of the place. So probably they were just going there and sinking one by one into that, you know, muddy area. Yes. And so, so from the social behavior, this is what I was going to say is uh, not so much is known. We know that uh, from Sevsk in Russia, that uh, woolly mammoths was living in herds up to 33 individuals, uh, from very young ones to very old uh, uh, matriarchs. Uh, but we don't know anything about burying their youngsters. Maybe I can jump in here a little bit and say that in, in African and Asian elephants, I'm not aware of such such habits. And what we have these elephant cemeteries is just because certain individuals happen to, to die in, in a similar area. We have seen in documentaries, for instance, in the Elephant Queen, uh, if you watch that documentary field in southern Kenya, in Tsavo, you will see that uh, a baby, a female baby elephant dies quite, uh, you know, at an early, she was, I think, just a few months old. 
is called Mimi in the in the movie, and you see there is no burial. You know, she's just left there, and then the family moves because it was a time of drought, and they needed to drink. So I don't think there is any evidence on that. And on these mammoth graveyards or elephant graveyards, as Dick said, in that case it was a trap. Elephants were just falling one after the other, and usually males and males of these inexperienced males. You know, at the time they just left the maternal family, so they were like teenagers. And in present day elephants, it could be also very old bulls dying in the same area because it will be a marshy area with softer food for their last pair of molars. And that is why it will be like this old bull, sometimes big tusks, because they just go and die all of them in a part of a marshland because they simply don't have the molars to feed, for instance, to browse, to feed on bushes, on trees and all that. So all these are just myths, the elephant graveyards. They are interested. Elephants are interested in the remains of other elephants. They smell the skulls. They take out even the tusks from the alveoli and all that. But there is no evidence whatsoever of burial or cemetery of an elephant just because they have that vision of a cemetery, not at all. And now I see another question. If there are any fossil records of co-occurrences of humans and uh, mammals. Yes, this I can already maybe start a discussion here. And Dick is better placed because he went to the US to those places where we have human hunters. Because by the way, of what was discovered in Botrop, in Botrop we have, you know, the lion paws in the mud and then the wolf and the reindeer. But in, in some places in the United States, we have actually the mammoth steps in, in the mud and then the humans following into those steps. So maybe Dick, you want to take it from there. Well, we know that there was a lot of interaction between humans and uh, uh, mammoths, and also other Pleistocene elephants, like the straight tusked elephant um, from uh, Neumark Nord in Germany, where they have found cut marks on bones of uh, large uh, forest elephants, this Elephas anticus, as it is called, but also where you are referring to the interaction between uh, humans and uh, 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 elephants in White Sands National uh, Park in the United States, in New Mexico, where they have found beautiful tracks of proboscideans, most probably Colombian mammoths, but also from uh, giant ground sloths and from camels and uh, uh, big, big uh, carnivorous animals and footprints of humans. And I remember that I was cleaning one of these huge footprints of a Colombian mammoth, a front uh, foot. And when I cleaned it, in the middle was the uh, footprint of a human. So more or less the same age as uh, the Proposidians uh, of White Sands National uh, Park in the United States. I don't know whether Charles Lampos wants to add something to this uh, answer. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I wanted to say that not only do we have uh, records of co occurrence and interaction, but it's actually um, a lot of scientists have been looking into that. Could humans be at least partially responsible for the extinction of the megafauna? So did we hunt mammoths and other large animals to extinction? So. Uh, my impression is that the consensus is that maybe humans were not the only factor. I mean, there have been um, some species might have been in decline um, before humans intensified their hunting and maybe also they survived other periods of warming. Uh, but of course, you know, when your um, when it is a warmer period and you're uh, you're expanded in a much smaller area and you have additional hunting pressure by a sophisticated predator, again, this could be um, another contributing factor. Definitely, definitely. Maybe the one that really shifted the balance into sending the, the woolly elephants into, into history. Um, I see another another interesting question here, which actually is linked to what you have just said. Um, 
another colleague is asking which are the environmental factors and evolutionary pressures that contributed to the development of different species of prehistoric elephants. Would like to, to start. I can say a few words about that. Uh, let's go back to the end of the Pliocene, the beginning of the Pleistocene in Northwestern Europe, in the Netherlands. We have about 2.6 million years ago, mastodons living in this small country, especially on the river banks, but not big mastodons. It's the so-called mastodon of Auvergne, Anancus arvernensis. And it was a pure browser. It is not an elephant. It was a mastodon, a nipple-toothed animal, but completely prehistoric because they are entirely extinct in Europe and Asia about 1.7 million years ago. And this mastodon of Auvergne was living on the riverbanks of the eastern Scheldt River, coming from the south towards the North Sea area. And what happened 2.6 million years ago, another proboscidian was coming to this area, and it was the huge Mammutus meridionalis, the mammoth of the south, which came out of Africa. And that is an animal, as I have told you this afternoon, with a shoulder height of 4 meters and 20 at shoulder. The mastodon is much, much smaller. Maximum male individuals measure only 2.6 meters at shoulder. And these animals came together in the same area. And then they start to compete because both wants to fill up the same niche of the uh, environment. And it was the big one who pushed out the Anancus arvernensis. And it was the Mammutus meridionalis which survived. But Mammutus uh, meridionalis, in its turn, was facing some big, big problems. Changing of climate, of subtropical to cold, cold climate. And its food, the trees, the shrubs, started to disappear. And there was nothing to eat. So the southern mammoths should become extinct or... And it was successful in adapting itself to the changing environment, to the changing food. And it changed from a browser into a grazer. And it survived. And later on, by becoming colder in colder climates, uh, more uh, extensive uh, steppes, it turned into the so-called woolly mammoths. And then at the end of the Pleistocene, around 12,000 years ago, when dramatic changes of climate took place, the woolly mammoth, as a pure grazer, at the top of its evolutionary lineage, was facing these dramatic changes of climate. And the cold and dry, treeless grass steppes disappeared. The area in which it was living became smaller and smaller because of the sea level, which was rising for more than 100 meters. And that caused the extinction of the mammoths. So I hope with these arguments, I have uh, contributed to the question of the development of the different species of proboscideans in the Pleistocene. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this I, is I, I, also, not overnight. Yes, I would like to add uh, something to that, if I may. So uh, we talk a lot, of course, about how does the environment affect the evolution of these animals, but we shouldn't ignore that um, their sexual behavior is also a factor driving their um, evolution. For example, the characteristic of uh, these proboscidians, their tusks, you know, the large, particularly the large tusks of uh, the males, uh, we know that they have a sexual function, either between competition between males or to attract the opposite sex. And um, for example, um, uh, in Greece, together uh, with Dick and Professor Vagilia Tsukala from the Aristotle University there, uh, we have been excavating at the site of Mila in Gravena, 
where we found um, these um, large tasks, the largest tasks of any proboscidean ever found in the world, five meters and uh, two centimeters, if I'm not mistaken, is the largest. And of course, the question is, why did they need to be so large? Why would any proboscidean, they belong to a mastodon, so-called mammoth borsoni, and they date to about uh, three million years ago. So why would any proboscidean would need so large tusks? Um, and one possible interpretation is exactly their sexual function, that we had uh, a, a kind of um, uh, males competing and who, who has the longest tusks, and therefore they reach this uh, great size. Um, so that might have led to their to them evolving that, but could it be that it um, indirectly at least led to their doom? Because, um, for example, I was reading the book of uh, Raman uh, Sukumar on the Asian elephants, and he mentioned there he, the studies that he did um, on the I think it was a dunk of the elephants, and he said that. Uh, the bigger taskers, they have more parasites. So I'm wondering... The, other way, the longer the task, the less parasites. No, the longer the task, the more parasite, if I remember it. No, correctly. no, no. Maybe? The other way around. No. The longer the task, the less parasites, nematodes. This is the oh, task okay, in okay. 98 and was taken back. Right. In the so that is why what I say is the longer, the healthier. And that is why mm -hmm, it's yeah. the opposite. The ones with long tusks, they are the peak of evolution. And mm -hmm. normally selected by females. They are really the result of natural selection. And the elephants of today, you see, Asian elephants like this one, like Siam, you see, and African elephants like Satao, you see, these are big tuskers. This is mm -hmm. how they were you know, designed by mother nature, but because of human-made reverse selection, the opposite of natural selection, we have now small task bulls. And what is important, I would like to add something here because what Raman Sukumar in his book says, he says that Asian elephants, for instance, if we get back to them a little bit, but this is important for all elephant species. He says that maybe they invested somehow some in body size and some in ivory size, but this is not really true. Because I had the occasion to, to examine, to personally examine the skeleton, the biggest preserved skeleton in an Asian elephant in India, which is the Bilkandi skeleton. It's huge, it's as big as pretty much the biggest, you know, woolly mammoths in Europe. And that one was a big tusker, yeah? So elephants of very big size also invested in very big ivory. And also elephants of smaller body size from the same species like Mr. Kabini, you see this one on this uh, on this pin, uh, you know, symbol of, of India, he also had very, very long ivory. So it means that in evolutionary terms, long ivory was there irrespective of the body size. Big body size, small body size, natural selection by female was in this direction of long ivory because this was like the, uh, you know, the health certificate of the animal because when yeah. they go to, to breed, they don't go like people before marriage, you know, to have a, a health certificate. No, they just show I have a big ivory. Okay, maybe probably I'm healthy. I have the good genetics and then I'm healthy, you know, to really uh, be able to to showcase those good genetics. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I made the mistake. So yeah, the longer the task, the lower the... Um, the healthier. Uh, low, yeah. But the thing is that um, this is also uh, a handicap to have this very large task, you know, like the peacock. Um, it has this very large tail, but it doesn't necessarily um, help no, it to survive. It helps it to reproduce. So maybe that was also something that sexual selection possibly could have uh, led to these animals when the conditions changed then in the quaternary when uh, the environment changed, maybe they couldn't maintain themselves. So also sexual selection plays a role in the lives of these animals, the evolution. Yeah, here I would think that sexual selection plays a role in, in the good sense that the strongest will really survive. And if we look at the woolly mammoths, if we look at woolly mammoths from 10,000 years ago, they don't have 
uh, you know, smaller tasks than those like 200,000 years ago. And that is why I think that if that would have been, you know, like uh, the woolly mammoths would, you know, would go extinct just because of the size of the ivory. I don't think that uh, that is uh, really true because they could keep, you know, the size of the ivory through, throughout their existence and throughout, you know, this dancing of ice ages up and down, north and south. So it was probably what killed them was probably humans, as you said earlier. I think that is the main factor and then climate change contributed to that. Uh, but now maybe we, we get to, to another question. There is a question about why certain elephants have additional tusks, because we have seen that example of a woolly mammoth with four tusks. We know examples of Asian African elephants with four tusks. So Dick, do you want maybe to, to start? Yep, no problem. Um, in fact, it's quite easy to answer this question because we have to go back in time to the Eocene and there we see the first so-called proboscideans, a uh, animal called Morotherium, having four incisors. <clears throat> we have to understand that the tusk in present-day elephants and in mammoths and in mastodons are the incisors, but they have only two. <clears throat> but originally, in the Eocene, they had four, and one of the genes is sometimes showing this old character, and then a, four, a third or a fourth tusk shows up. We know some uh, uh, skulls of uh, it's also shown in molars that you see once in a while that they are not replacing their molars horizontally like in all proboscideans, but sometimes like uh, the vertically replacements of molars. I have answered the question already to uh, 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 in in the chat. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, I don't think I see you. I see new new questions. Let me check. So. Maybe ask you another question myself. We have so many tusks from woolly mammoths that we discovered, you know, in the fossil record. But how often it is for us to get a skull, a skull with the degree of preservation as Halton, for instance? How often do we get that? It depends on from uh, which sediment the skull comes from. But you know. Uh, the remains in the Netherlands of Pleistocene fauna elements is are always dredged up below the water level, so there are no in situ excavations. In Holteren, in Germany, the skull Garalampos has in his museum was excavated in situ in the original layer, and then it depends on the composition of the layer: is it sandy or? Is it with a lot of clay or is it pure clay? If it is pure clay, the bones will turn out perfectly. But if it is just sand, they might be weathered already in the sediment. But, you know, the one from Bottrop, and you have seen that one, uh, uh, Diane, it's uh, really superb. Uh, I want <coughs> in the collections here too, which is very good state of preservation. I have seen from Russia, from the ever frozen ground, superb specimens, and also from um, uh, Yukon uh, as the hawk mining on 60 Mile, which I showed in my presentation. It's a wonderful preservation of that skull. And but in, for Western Europe, the one which is in the collection in Bottrop, in my opinion, is unique. Thank you. Uh, there was another question to which I think we partially answered during our exchanges, and there is a lot of speculation there. So I don't know if to take it, you know, people want to talk about these theories for the extinction of the uh, Irish deer, but there is, I think, too much speculation there. But if you want to, to say something. 
not for me. No, so maybe maybe we 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 skip that one because I think it's too much speculation and uh, you know I'm a big fan of of facts and when we have something to really prove better the the kind of of theories we we put forward. So I see another question about African elephants. That's one you should answer, I think. Okay, so I will I will talk about that. Well, we really do not know for sure why female Asian elephants do not have tusks right now. They, they might have some of them just very small. They are called tashis. Uh, I think that Raman Sukumar, with a team, they are doing right now all sorts of comparative DNA analysis, and they try to figure out why females lost, lost their task at some point. Their preliminary views, I think, are related to the fact that maybe at some point, Asian elephant didn't have enough access to quality, you know, food. And that is why for females, because, you know, they have to invest uh, a lot in uh, producing the babies, you know, and having their skeleton and then in lactation. So all that, you know, consumes a lot of energy. And we know that female elephants, they stop their body growth when they are about, I don't know, 15 to 20 years old. But bull elephants, they basically grow till about 30, 30 and something in height. And then they still become a little bit, you know, wider and stronger. So they are growing all their lives. And a bull elephant, which is 40 years old, in African elephants will be usually twice the size. Yeah, 100% than a female. So the bull elephant will invest in its body size and its own skeleton and in tusk in ivory size, while the female has less resources to invest in her body size and ivory size because those resources will go into making babies, you know, from uh, the pregnancy to lactation, you know, uh, to provide milk for the babies. So that is why females in all these species will have also biological constraints in developing very big ivory like males. They may develop long ivory, but that will be thin and light, much lighter in comparison to the bulls. And uh, this is one, one comment. Then I think ivory is there with, with uh, you know, with a, for a reason. If in Asian elephants, all females, they lost that, for some reasons we do not understand yet. Uh, this is how we, it is. But in African elephants, in a normal, in a healthy elephant population, taskless females are less than 5%. Uh, and those tasks are still important for all sorts of things. Uh, for females, you know, there will be less for display purposes, unless it's a very old matriarch where those tasks may serve also display purposes, so like a status to signal to the others the status of that female. Uh, but um, unlikely, like in the case of the bulls, where it's mainly status, for females, they are also, you know, tools. Uh, the tasks are also tools. So if they are there, they are for a reason. And tasks are, pre are present in, in pretty much all proboscideans and in all female proboscideans. And if in a species, naturally, they are there, in my opinion, they should be there. I don't think this is good to say, oh, now it's good that we killed so many of these taskers, then now it's so good that we have just magnas for the bulls or taskless females for the females because they will be safe from poachers. Well, we do not really fully understand the consequences of that. And in a healthy elephant population, if those percentages are extremely low, there that happens for, for a reason. And as I said, these studies already on bulls in, in southern India are, are saying that the longer the task, the healthier the elephant bull. Probably more studies are needed, but in females, it could be also associated to their overall, you know, fitness and health and all that. So that is why I'm, I have huge reservations in saying that it's good that now we have taskless females or taskless bull. No, I think that is extremely bad. Those individuals are not the result of natural selection. They are not produced under natural conditions. They are a result of human-made reverse selection, which is the opposite of natural selection. So I hope that I provided some, some elements. Okay, very good. Uh, I have one last question. 
because Please. I think it's already two hours after our start. Uh, and one last question for Harald Lampros. He should make some advertising for the museum because he has a new plan for a new design of this unique museum in Bottrop in Germany where they, where they have this wonderful collection of Pleistocene memorial remains. Harald Lampros, can you tell me why the Saiga antelope is your favorite late Pleistocene animal? Yeah, so as I said, um, the Saika antelope just looks so bizarre because uh, it has this very large nose turtles. And uh, well, the question is, why does it have these nose turtles? Uh, there are different theories. So one is possibly maybe they uh, warm the air that they breathe and moisten it because, as I said, they live in a cold and dry environment. Uh, it could be related with an um, enhanced uh, sense of uh, smell. Um, as far as I know, we don't have like a definite answer, but these are some uh, hypotheses that have been proposed. So we can conclude that the environment of the icon of the uh, woolly mammoths, which is known by everybody in the world, in the northern and the southern hemisphere, was a cold and dry environment. And one of the indicators for that is the Saiga antelope. Am I right? The Saiga antelope is a um, um, vital component of the so-called mammoth powder. Yeah, that lived in the mammoth step. Yeah, and you know why I'm asking this question, uh, dear friend, is that we know the Saiga antelope from the United Kingdom from Denmark, from Germany, from France, from Belgium, oh. but not from the Netherlands. So all the countries surrounding the Netherlands has Saiga antelope, but not the Netherlands. So I hope that one of my friends in the Netherlands one day will find a nice skull cap, a neurocranium with the tiny little horn course attached to it to show that the Saiga antelope during the late Pleistocene was a common animal on the extensive, cold, dry, and treeless mammoth steppe. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank the organizers, uh, especially Naveen and uh, Megana, and everybody, and you, uh, Haralampos, and of course, Dion for participating and uh, making this attractive. And I hope that everybody joined it. I did at least, every second. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Same here, Dick. I Thank think you very much. Of you, we're just uh, really honored to have all the three of you here. And we just kind of didn't even know how the two hours passed. And uh, the depth of knowledge that all of you have is really amazing. And uh, of course, like how Dick always says, the energy and the excitement Oh, it's, it's we really enjoyed it, and I hope all the your participants who uh, who participated also, you know, took home a lot of uh, information and details. So, from friends of elephants team, a big thank you to all of you. Thank thanks for your time, and uh, we hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a happy Easter. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Same, Thank you. Same to all of you. Okay, I'll end the meeting. Bye.